And 20 years ago, a group of West Michigan people who had creative students in their family wanted to figure out how to show them how to find a career in this industry. A group of people like Bill McKendry from Hannah McKendry, who had an advertising firm here, uh, started pulling together classes so the students could do that. One of the people who joined them early on from the industry was Ralph Winter. So Ralph's been a partner with Compass now for over 20 years, and we're really grateful for that. The Compass team works with local and national people to actually prepare the students. It requires, in this industry, it requires more than just filming, but it also requires the people skills, the work ethic, and the integrity, integrity you need um, to be on the team. So it's a very important thing we try to teach people to be well-rounded and then to walk out their faith in this industry. The result is that there's, we offer Compass students a Bachelor of Fine Arts as well as an associate's degree. And we do that in addition to linking them with people in the industry. So they have the opportunity to network and to learn from those people. So at, that, at this point, what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you a bio on Ralph Winter so you know what Ralph's about. Ralph's proven to be one of the hospital's most profitable assets, producing most motion pictures and television. It's Ralph who produced the first three X-Men films, Tim Burton's Planet of the Apes, the Fantastic Four movies, Wolverine Origins with Hugh Jackman. 2013, Ralph produced The Giver, starring Jeff Bridges, Meryl Streep, Katie Holmes, Alex Skarsgård, and Taylor Swift, directed by Bruce Noyce, or Philip Noyce. Also, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, The Green Destiny. He filmed that in New Zealand and China for Netflix's first original movie. Outside the major films, Ralph also does independent films. He did Captive, which is based on the true story of Ashley Smith, released by Paramount. He was in Spain, Malta, and Portugal, where he produced The Promise with Christian Bale and Oscar Isaac, and with George, uh, Terry George directing, which is an epic love story against World War I and the fall of the Ottoman Empire and the story of the Armenian Genocide in 1915. Recently, Al, Ralph also produced the pilot, Altered Carbon, for a series Netflix released in February 2018, a movie that was shot in Fiji and New Zealand. He also did Adrift, starring um, Shailene Woody and uh, Sam Clarifin, directed by Balsasar, I'm probably gonna ruin this, um, Corman Corps. <laughs> and uh, currently he's producing a pilot. I'm sure he'll uh, fix that up by, uh, when he comes on. And currently he's producing a pilot for a series for HBO Max called Tokyo Vice, based on the book about a journalist and the Yakuza in Japan. Michael Mann is directing that pilot and he's executive producing a nine episode high profile series in Tokyo that shot this last February. Ralph's a graduate of UC Berkeley and Ralph's also engaged, though, in community affairs, performing arts projects. He speaks in the US, he speaks overseas in universities, film festivals, and serves on several film advisory boards. He's an active member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, as well as the Directors Guild and the Producers Guild. So Ralph comes to the table with experience throughout the industry. And if you're not familiar with what a producer does, it's very simple. He does everything. He takes the money from the studio, from the investors. He works with the directors, the actors, all the way down to the makeup people and everybody in between to pull together the story from pre-production to the final product. And then at the end of that, when you go through the different Academy Awards, the final award for best picture is awarded to the producers. That's what Ralph brings to the table here. Our format today is gonna to be that Ralph and I have a few questions we're gonna go through together. And then after we go through those, we're gonna open this up where you can actually send in questions here on Zoom and our team will go through and look at those and we'll be asking Ralph those questions. So you get a chance to ask Ralph questions directly. I wanna just thank Ralph for the friendship and support that he's provided to Compass and to me personally over these years. And uh, Ralph, at this point in time, if you can join us uh, on, on set here, I guess the question is if you're ready to do some storytelling with me, let's roll. I'm ready if can I can ahead? start the video. Can't start All the right. video. Unable All to start right. video. Okay, there we go. Let's start now. Okay, here we All go. All right. Hey, cool. Well, thanks Good. for joining us. This is great. 
And, and you got the beard going. That's cool. Yeah. You know, the Moses roll, whatever, you know, COVID. <laughs> yeah. And, and, Barbershops and aren't open mil- here yet. <laughs> oh, yeah. I just had mine open today. And yeah. I don't know if that was good or bad. And, and uh-huh. I see you got a few movie posters in your office, huh? Yeah. You know, uh, Hocus Pocus and uh, Mighty Joe Young. And, um, yeah. you know, I kept some posters of, of uh, the cast that signed stuff for me. So it's kind of fun, little memories and Every once in a while, I'll change them out. Just you know, so it's kind of fun. That's Keeps cool. me uh, re- reminded of uh, good projects and fun things that we did. So that's good. Well, you know, the first question I wanted to ask you about, you know, you've produced so many types of stories, and as a result, you've touched millions of lives. And with all those experiences, I was kind of curious, how do you de- define success as a producer? Well, I think there's a, there's a couple of ways. Certainly, you know, box office uh, is one marker, although that's probably more marketing than it is the movie. But, you know, if a movie connects with people, you know, people come see it and the word of mouth is sort of the holy grail of marketing and people telling other people that the movie's enjoyable. You know, you're trying to, we're trying to produce entertainment and trying to produce something people enjoy. And hopefully there's a legacy to that and it lasts, you know, um, for me, uh, uh, you know, talking to fifth graders in a school um, who, when they read off the kind of movies that I'd made, they, mm-hmm. they uh, mention a movie that, like Star, one of the Star Trek movies that they weren't even born when that movie was made. And yet they've caught up with that movie from their parents or however and enjoyed the movie. And that's kind of a wonderful lasting, um, you know, legacy that it's provided some entertainment and people have, have enjoyed, um, you know, that story. So that brings a lot of uh, satisfaction to, to know that what you've worked on is enjoyed by a lot of people over a lot of years. And so, you know, that's, to me, that's what makes it worthwhile. Um, you know, you want to, you, you like all your movies and, you know, you want, you love all your children, but um, there's some movies that probably, you know, they could fade into the background and be fine with me. But, um, you know, to me, movies that last, that, that's the mark of success. Hmm. That makes sense. You know, with each television uh, and, TV and movie that happens, we all see the end product, but there's a whole journey that went into that. And you've had so much success with this. And I'm sure, you know, we all go through successes and failures or learn from those kind of things. Um, are there some underlying principles that you apply to, to pretty much all the productions? Well, certainly in my role as a producer and, and building the team, it's important to, uh, you know, that you cast people that want to do excellent work, that want to work with you, that want to, you know, work hard. But I think for me, it's also, I got to apply fair principles in the way I treat people. And I think, Mm -hmm. frankly, as a person of faith, that's more important than any words you'd say. It's how you treat Mm -hmm. people. That's what matters. And uh, that's what gets, you know, people to come back and work for you again, is the way you treat people. And I think that's Mm -hmm. um, so important that you know, we're, we're making a project, we want to get to the goal line, but we all have to get there together. It doesn't help if we kill each other along the way. That doesn't make the product better and it doesn't make uh, the experience any more uh, interesting. So to me, it's, it, it, it's how you treat people. It's how you uh, manage that. You want people that are going to work hard. You want people that uh, are interested in achieving the same kind of goals you are. So... Mm-hmm sorting that out, finding those people, discerning who those people are, managing that, providing leadership. Um, Mm -hmm. Those are sort of the general principles that I would apply on any project. Looking the other way, when you're looking for folks that you want to have on a set, that you want to be part of the team, what are the three or four characteristics you really look for in determining who you want on your team? Well, I look for people that, you know, can deliver, if they're a prop master, they can deliver the best 
props. They know how to do it. They know how to organize their own internal team. Um, or in the art department, you look at movies they've made and does the look fit the story? Is it, you know, are they storytellers? Everybody on mm -hmm. your crew needs to be a storyteller, you know, from costume design to art department to the camera. Every single department is helping you tell the story and thinking that mm -hmm. through. And you can tell that from interviewing people after reading the script and finding out if they, do they understand, do they get it? Um, mm -hmm. Are they going to be part of that process? And so, I mean, that's really the fundamental thing is how are they going to contribute and add value to the story? That makes sense. You'd mentioned something earlier. Um, I know you're, you're a Christian and but you produce a lot of non-faith-based movies. And so the question is, how do you make a difference in the industry as a Christian? Well, I, again, I think it goes back to how you treat people. I think that stands out. That stands behind what you value. That represents what you think is important and, and how you treat people. Um, it's not about words. Um, famous you know, people in the church history, you know, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. Um, mm -hmm. The way you act, the way you treat people, the way you, uh, what you value, um, you know, that, that comes across. You don't need to uh, quote Bible verses to demonstrate that you believe in something greater than yourself. Um, so, I, I think it plays out very practically and again in relationships and sometimes it plays out on the story in terms of what you fight for, what's important, what, um, what is worthwhile in getting across in the story. But hopefully you've done some of that homework at the beginning when, you know, before you signed on and talk those things out with the people that are shaping the story at the beginning, if you aren't the one shaping the story. Mm -hmm. So for people who aren't familiar with the industry, you know, they, they assume if it's not a Christian based story that why are Christians in the industry? And what I hear, what I'm hearing you say, it's as much as how you behind, how you work with people behind the camera is in front of the camera. It, it is. And, you know, look, how do you be a Christian in the real estate business or the investment banking business? It's about being excellent. It's about being the best that you can be and demonstrating you know, that you're going to make a good product or you're going to provide a good service or you're going to provide something that's excellent. I think that's what, as people of faith, I think that's what we were called to. So I don't think it's much different than any other business. Um, mm -hmm. You want to do excellent work and it's how you treat people. It's how you uh, go after the goal and, and how you organize the team to, uh, to get there. Mm -hmm. That makes perfect sense. You know, well, you've produced movies and TV shows, commercials. What do you see the career opportunities like now in the industry? Because things are changing. It's gone from, you know, I, I would guess when you started, it's probably 35 millimeter and then it became digital and now there's streaming and there's all these different things. What, how, how do you see the career opportunities coming in, in the future for this next generation? Well, I, I, look, I think the opportunities are huge. I think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity. Right now, there's 500 scripted television shows, 500. I mean, that's a lot of work and a lot of appetite for 26 streaming services if you want all those streaming services in your home. Mm -hmm. um, that alone is, is a tremendous amount of work that needs craftspeople, technicians, storytellers, uh, marketing, distribution, all of that. And it's a, you know, a high point in terms of employment uh, in our business. Now, mm -hmm. the pause with the coronavirus is, you know, we'll see how that shakes out and how that's different. But mm -hmm. storytelling is a part of every business. I started out making industrial videos for a department store when I was out of college. And I made about 50 of those short five minute um, industrial videos, how to mm -hmm. train employees about how to ring the register, how to treat, how to greet customers, how to prevent uh, mm -hmm. theft and shrinkage, how to promote yeah. sales. And uh, you learn a great deal uh, in, in that business and they need storytellers. Um, and if you think about it, 
you know, musicians talk about the narrative of their song and the courtrooms talk about storylines and every, every business is about story. And so you're learning skills that can apply anywhere. If you're mm-hmm. in sales, you know, it's about story. In politics for November, the best storyteller is going to win. Who tells the best mm-hmm. stories? Who's got the best stories that, are, that, that convince you that they're the right person for the job? Um, I think storytelling is sort of pervasive in our culture. And uh, we just do it as a very specific way to provide entertainment. Um, and, you know, that, that's, that's sort of our explicit, obvious goal. Um, but I think storytelling as a skill set is, um, again, you know, shot through our, mm-hmm. our, 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 our culture. Yeah. Well, you know, along that line, you know, so many people in the industry and you yourself have to go through and continue to work out your storytelling skills. Um, what, what are good opportunities for students to go ahead and do that and work and develop their story? telling skills? Like, do they need to be watching other films? Is it about reading books? What do, how do you do that? Or how do people in the industry do that and keep maturing that skill set? Sure. I think, I think it's all of those things. It is, you know, if you're going to be disciplined about it, it depends on, you know, what your diet is going to be. Uh, Mm -hmm. You can have a diet of watching the transformer films and that's fine. That's great popcorn, but I'm Mm -hmm. not sure that's going to make you a better storyteller filmmaker. Um, I think that if you want to write, you ought to be reading Academy, Writers Guild, Directors Guild, um, Emmy winning screenplays. Mm-hmm. Uh, how, how is that done? You, all those are available online. Wh- why are they honoring those uh, projects? Why is that good storytelling? And you need to sort of digest uh, all of those kinds of materials and see what makes those great. And do I have what it takes to sort of, you know, participate in that. And then if you're going to be a writer, you ought to be writing, you ought to be writing a lot. Um, Mm -hmm. And, and, and doing that all in your spare time. Uh, I think, I think the same is true about movies in general. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's always sort of a refreshing and, educational to see what new movies are coming out. And certainly we in the Academy try to nominate, you know, best picture nominees, 10 of those a year that we think are interesting storytelling. Um, somehow there's value in that and why. And, and um, I even do a class at my church when I'm in town where we go through those 10 uh, nominees and see why are they important? What, what's the filmmaker trying to say? What's, do we agree with that or don't we with our worldview? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a worthwhile process to sort of analyze that and digest that. Um, yeah, the, there's a, a wealth of books to read. Um, there's, you know, maybe production going on in Michigan that you can go visit and see what's going on. And you can mm-hmm. make films. You, you know, I learned a lot making 50 uh, short films. I've destroyed most of those. so You'll never see my mistakes. Um, but you, that's how you learn. You learn, um, by, by trying it and by figuring it out. And, um, that's what makes you a better storyteller. That can make you a better filmmaker. Uh, that's what makes you a better writer. Um, I do think it starts with the writing and, and that's a high calling. And, you know, I think it matters what you write. Why wouldn't you, if you're going to want to be a writer, why wouldn't you want to write something that changes your life? Why would you Mm -hmm. spend all that effort and time unless it's you're writing about something that is going to change you and think deeply about that. Um, You probably need to write five or 10 screenplays to get a good one. Uh, You know, here in California, you know, everybody's writing a script. Everybody's sending me stuff all the time, wanting me to read their stuff. Um, it's, It's easy to sort of write but to write something that people want to see and to mm-hmm. make something that people actually want to pay for, that's a very small category. And for me as a producer, figuring out the difference between those is mm-hmm. what uh, builds your skill as a producer. Wow. The, um, 
with the number of people who are trying to enter the film industry, because we talked about the opportunities are really expanding. Uh, I know the industry relationship piece is really important to getting in. Um, so, so it's very relational based. Where, where does the bachelor's degree come in to, and how important is having that bachelor's degree to come into the film industry? Uh, I'll answer, there's two questions there and I'll answer the, the, okay. the second one first about a bachelor's degree. Look, I'm, I'm a history major out of Berkeley and I think that's a great foundation. I didn't, I didn't design to go into the, the movie business. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, sort of right place, right time. But the history um, training has been a great background for storytelling and what's important and uh, the sort of interesting hinge points in world history and how events change and who are the people involved in those events and why is that important and what can we learn from that and how do we not re repeat the same mistakes that mm -hmm. you know, people made 100, 200, 300 years ago? What can we learn? Right. Um, I think that liberal arts education, that, you know, history, English literature, uh, writing, um, any of those are, are a great foundation. Um, because you don't know how it's going to work out with filmmaking. You need a, a, a good base of uh, where to operate. I think also, depending on the school you go to, you can build a, a camaraderie of other folks that, that also have achieved that bachelor's degree and, mm -hmm. and uh, use that as a a way to connect and move forward. You, you stay close with those, those college friends in, uh, mm -hmm. as, as you develop in your career. Um, and that's the other thing you mentioned about relationships. Sometimes there's a, a false uh, fear about, oh, I can't, move, I can't work in the movie business because uh, you, know, you need to have the right relationships and it's all about relationships. Well, mm -hmm. I think that's true about the investment banking business. I think that's true about real estate. I think that's true about you know, any job that you want to go after, it's all about relationships. Mm -hmm. um, how do you make friends? How do you uh, meet other people? It's the same kind of thing um, that, that happens and people break into the business every day in Hollywood. So I, I don't want to, I don't think you should put the relational thing as, as too much of an insider business. I don't think that's true. I think it's uh, as inside as it is getting into uh, a tech startup in Silicon Valley as it is to uh, get inside of uh, a television show. But again, mm -hmm. with 500 scripted shows and uh, so many streaming services and everybody looking to make content, um, I think there's lots of opportunities to make friends, to build relationships, and then demonstrate whether or not you've got the skill set that's going to add value to their projects. That's what you have to figure out. Where, where's the value that I can add? That's the trick. Mm -hmm. You know, you and I were talking uh, about a week ago, and one of the questions I asked about was uh, for our students and our alumni who aren't in LA, who are trying to work on developing their storytelling skills and producing their storytelling skills, uh, I asked, is there a good way for them to do that, to kind of build their, um, to, build, to build that? And you'd mentioned about what you've seen people do for churches. And I was going to ask if you could share a little bit about that, about the stewardship part of it. Yeah. So um, one of the things that I did that, you know, if you're in a faith community and there's a perfect oppor opportunity, there's a, there again, the media needs of 200,000 churches across the country uh, need people that are skilled in storytelling and uh, mm -hmm. using visuals, using media, um, uh, not every pastor has that skill set. They might be a good mm -hmm. speaker, but they may not possess the skills of uh, how to communicate that with visuals and with moving pictures, et, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the ways you can demonstrate whether or not you have the, the skill set for directing and storytelling is make the stewardship video in your church. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody, nobody's gonna, nobody else is stepping forward to do that. Uh, they've mm -hmm. got to go out and convince someone to do it. Why don't you volunteer? Why don't, you, why don't you show people that you have the ability within five to seven minutes to talk about and show the compelling nature of your uh, faith organization, how you're going to uh, impact the world, where the money goes, how it impacts people, and why you should take the Visa card out of your wallet and run it to the machine at the end of your seven-minute presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, that demonstrates... You, 
you got a, a, a the pastor and the leadership will be willing and, and helpful. You can do it any way you want. Um, and you're going to know in 10 minutes after it shows whether or not it was effective or not. You're going to get instant feedback. Um, do that. Demonstrate, you know, show, do that to demonstrate that you have the skill set to tell a story. It's, it doesn't cost much and um, you'll get plenty of, of uh, encouragement along the way. And uh, mm -hmm. you just have to uh, deliver. I've Could done you put five it on a demo six... reel? Why not? I don't see why not. I, I've made five or six of those over the years and um, you learn fast. You learn fast when you're editing all night and it's uh, 4.30 in the morning and you don't have the shot that you need to make that story work the way you want. Um, it's a sharp learning curve and you got to present it at the 9.30 service. Um, but you got to do that. You got to go through that. You got to uh, experience that. And I think that's a great way to hone your skills of how am I going to tell a story with very specific parameters that I have to meet as a goal and a guideline. Wow. You know, Ralph, I was going to ask you, um, do you have any, I know you had uh, some Compass students on uh, a film or two. And I was just kind of curious if, if you have any memories of, of that you could share. I think the, the, the one I remember uh, the most, and I haven't had a chance to have a lot of interns because really in the past 20 years, I haven't worked in the U.S. I've worked all over the world mm -hmm. because of the financing and incentives that are out there. Do you have a lot of frequent uh, flyer miles? <laughs> I do. I actually have a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's good news and bad news. Don't tell my wife. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but I do remember in Vancouver, uh, Ryan Hartsock and one other gentleman came up and spent time with us on X-Men 2 and actually had an opportunity to spend a lot of time with uh, Brian Singer. Unfortunately, it was during the shooting day and it didn't really please me because they should have done that after hours, but whatever. Mm -hmm. um, they got a chance to interact with Brian and, um, and I think uh, learned a lot of seeing how that production operated um, at a pretty high level in, you know, it was almost 20 years ago. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, it's fun to have interns and over the years I've had the opportunity to do that and it's fun to see some like Ryan take advantage of that and learn how to apply that and take that into their business and go forward with it. Others, mm -hmm. you know, are casual observers and whether that means anything or goes anywhere, I don't know. But mm -hmm. uh, I, I know it did go somewhere with Ryan. And, uh, and so, yeah, those are great memories for, uh, for all of us. That's great. Well, you know, at this point in time, what I want to do is I want to give, uh, we've got a number of questions in. And so I'm actually going to uh, pull some of these up here and okay. give the audience a chance to ask some questions here too. Terrifying. Um, <laughs> yeah. One of the first questions we got here are what are the responsibilities of a faith-based film in today's globally connected world? Well, I think uh, certainly responsibilities make a good picture. You know, if you're making a movie that's going to be about entertainment, hopefully you're making something that's entertaining. Um, if you're trying to make something that's a bit more political or a bit more topical, you know, mm -hmm. that becomes a little different. Um, you know, it's how you're going to connect with an audience. There's lots of off color, irreverent material that gets made. Um, and I don't think everyone takes that responsibility seriously, but then again, some of those things don't really get an audience either. So, Mm -hmm. I, I think it's about integrity. It's about you as a filmmaker. What are you, what are you trying to say? And can you say it in a compelling way that gets an audience to stand up and pay attention? Um, again, I don't think there's any bad stories. Every story has value and worth, but there are a limited number of stories that an audience will pay for. And figuring that out is what I do as a producer, trying to figure out what is actually going to get an audience. So uh, the less responsibility you have, the less integrity, the less mm -hmm. care you have in talking about whatever that subject matter is, uh, that'll come through in the storytelling. You know, Ralph, you just said something I think is really important. I remember uh, being at AFM a couple of years ago. And when I talked to the different distributors, I asked them, what do I tell the students at Compass about how, what's going to sell? How can they make something that will make money? And they said, please tell them 
to ask us what we what our clients want to see. And you just said, you go through and evaluate what's going to be a story that sells. How do you determine as a producer what you think will be a story that sells? What, what are the components of how you decide that? Well, it's, it's about an audience and about how you're going to get to an audience, okay? Mm-hmm. So uh, at Fox, we started something with some faith-based films in the $2 million range based on Frank Peretti books and Ted Decker books. And we made about five of those, and made them for a price. Um, and basically, I went to Fox and said, I can talk to that faith-based audience in a way that you can't. Uh, you don't understand. You don't understand the terminology. You don't understand how they think. But I can do that, and I can speak to that audience. And so we tried to tell those book-based stories uh, in $2 million movies to a very select audience, and then tried to tell the story in a way that it would widen out from that. Uh, and we were modestly successful and somewhat unsuccessful in doing that. Part of that is book buyers aren't necessarily ticket buyers. In, in reading a book, you, you've all read a book and, and then watch the movie and go, ah, I like the book better. Uh, because your mind can create things. When we made The Giver, it's about a dystopian future. And, you know, you can sort of make up what people are wearing. Well, when you make a movie, you got to decide. Does it, does it have buttons? Does it all, is it shaped in some futuristic way? And figuring that out on a price point is very difficult and very tricky to do. So, you know, being in touch with an audience and trying to figure that out um, Mm -hmm. becomes a critical skill. When we were doing Mm -hmm. uh, the Star Trek movies or the X-Men movies, there's a target audience, there's a bullseye of people that want the X-Men to look and feel and appear and talk in the way they do in the comic books. But if you made it just for the comic fans, um, you can't afford a $100 million budget. So you gotta tell the story in a way that pays attention to the people of the target audience, but also widens it out to moviegoers in general. And I think that's why the X-Men movies were successful, is that we were able to uh, widen out that audience. But that comes from, I don't know, I think some of it comes from a gut instinct of, Mm -hmm. Do other people want to see what, what moves me when I read a script and it moves me and it's emotional? Is that going to move other people to do that as well? Um, some of that's a gut instinct and based on experience. So, you know, you, you want to find some, to know what's going to sell, you're going to try to find some, uh, you know, collaboration, others that sort of feel and understand and think the same way. But, you know, the landscape's littered with, good stories that people don't don't watch um and it's it's tricky it's hard it's hard to find something that's really going to find a global uh, audience um so a movie comes out like the passion of the christ with mel gibson and does 700 million dollars in rentals and mm-hmm. uh, everybody tries to copy it but they can't um sometimes it's right place right time sometimes the right story a lot of those things affect that box office performance, Mm -hmm. but you have to pay attention to the audience. You've got to think about the audience when you're writing the script. Um, And that's why I said earlier, I think if you're a writer, you know, you should be writing something that's going to change your life because hopefully that's moving and compelling enough that it'll motivate and, and others will want to do the same thing. They'll, they want to be changed too. Wow. You know, another question that came along, uh, they ask, is how to work on projects, scenes, et cetera, that aren't in line with your spiritual views, or do you find it difficult to put your heart in a pro- or, pro- or into a project or a scene that you might not want your name on? Well, hopefully you try to figure that out at the beginning. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, ho- hopefully you um, figure that out from reading the script, talk, the, talk to the director. Um, mm-hmm. If you're being hired onto the project, for instance, that's what mm-hmm. that question sounds like, not something you've generated. Um, right. You got to be smart about it. You got to be smart about, you know, am I willing to, what, what other pictures is this director made or this producer or this studio? You know, mm-hmm. are those pictures I want to stand behind that I want to be involved with and have my name on? Now, I probably, if you were going to theoretically draw a line, I might draw that line a little wider than you might because mm-hmm. All of the work is good. Working is not a bad thing. 
um, working on horror movies at the beginning is not a bad thing. It's a job. You'll, you're going to learn. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that, you know, you want to be careful at the beginning to ask those questions to see, you know, is this something I want to be involved with? And, you know, if there's, if you got questions and you don't think it's going to work out and don't sign on, find something else. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another related question. This is interesting. Um, which of your productions, whether they're secular or not, do you feel communicated aspects of the redemptive story in a powerful way that impacted you and others around you? Well, I think, uh, there's a variety of, uh, you know, of, of ways to interpret that because certainly mm -hmm. we use the word uh, redemptive in storytelling in Hollywood in a different way, maybe than you might in a faith community, but it's mm -hmm. similar in terms of someone that sacrifices themselves um, for a better world or a better good. So we've, you know, we told those stories in, in Star Trek, uh, the wrath of Khan uh, uh, in, in particular, but, you know, we, we told those stories where people give up their life for someone else. Um, even in a movie like Hocus Pocus, which when I made the movie in 93, the uh, church community, you know, it came after me because I was making a movie about witches. Um, mm -hmm. But the story is about a boy who gives up his life to save his sister uh, and the witches get their comeuppance. Um, sometimes people only see what they want to see and we're trying to, uh, you know, rake me over the coals because I was making a movie that involved, you know, witches. How could you do that as a Christian? Well, how could you not tell a story about redemption, about how this boy goes on a journey and how he decides to sacrifice himself to uh, save his sister? So um, mm -hmm. I'd say most of sort of the classic hero's journey stories are about redemption and about sacrifice. Um, and certainly you see that in some of the X-Men movies. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you see it in most of the successful movies that are made um, have some element of redemption inside of them because that's something that we are drawn to and attracted to in storytelling. And it's the stories that we revisit and tell again and again. Um, mm -hmm. So I think you, again, from a storytelling skill Point of view, you look for those things at the beginning when you sign up. Mm -hmm. Does the story have those elements or a way to get there that is supportive and someplace you know you can do that? You may not have the power as the boom man or the or the camera operator to affect what the story is, but uh, you know you you should be making some of those decisions when you sign on if that's going to irritate you in the process mm -hmm. of working on the project. Yeah. Well, that kind of goes along with the uh, next question that was on here, which I think you probably touched on is what role, if any, does your faith play in choosing the projects you decide to produce? Um, and you know, the thing that goes along with that, I was thinking about, you've dealt with so many people in the industry. Um, are there certain things that you decide, what helps you decide what you do and don't want to be involved with or who, who you want to be involved with and who you don't? Well, it's not one thing. It's a, it's a series of things that you decide. And look, mm -hmm. some projects I take because I need a job. Other projects mm -hmm. I take and, and develop and spend time and stay off the market because I want to get them made. Uh, so there's lots of reasons uh, you know, a variety, not everything has to be, you know, a spiritual reason to decide what job you're going to work on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, who's directing? Um, is it financed? Is it going to get made? Am I wasting my time? Um, is it the story that I like or something that just feels like this is frivolous? Uh, you know, there's a, who are the players that are involved? So, when I was approached to work on uh, Planet of the Apes with Tim Burton, I said, yes, I didn't need to read the script. I want to work with Tim Burton, Planet of the Apes. That's, that's interesting and weird. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in. Uh, other projects take a lot more deliberation to uh, figure out, you know, what you want to do. I'm working with Michael Mann. Michael Mann is, is, a, is an icon in, in the movie and television business. Uh, he called me and, wanted, and asked if I would come work for him. 
So I'm in. Uh, we'll figure out the story and hopefully along the way, uh, I'll have a chance to interact with him and have had a chance, of course. We've started filming um, in Tokyo on our, our, our pilot. Um, that personality attracts me. I want to work with this icon in the business and find out how do I learn more and, mm -hmm. and how does he think, how does he process the stories he tells, um, you know, as that sort of icon. So I think there's a bunch of decisions that go into it. It isn't always a, for me, it isn't always a spiritual decision. Um, but again, for me, it's also, as I said early on, it's about how you treat people. And so I don't dissociate myself from my faith. I can't do that. I'm, I'm bringing all that to it. And, and look, today on the internet, everybody knows who I am in terms of, you know, they Google you or Facebook or whatever they do to figure out who you are. Right. So people know who you are before you sign up, before you get there. So I, I, got, I got nothing to hide. I'm not afraid. Um, and people that don't like what I believe or what I do or what I've worked on, then they don't call. It's okay. Yeah. I'm okay with that. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. The, um, you, one of the questions that somebody asked here is how much do you rely on readers and, and script coverage analysts as a producer for choosing which scripts you want to look at, or what do you look for in coverage to show that you trust the reader who would be doing that? I don't really rely on readers for what I do. Um, that's more of a studio production company job. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm not currently doing that. But I think when I was, you know, had my staff, you know, doing coverage for me, you, you look for, you know, an honest summary, an honest evaluation, and, and at least some point of view about, is there an audience for this property and mm -hmm. what, what's the likelihood that an audience would come and participate uh, with a story like this. So uh, it's, it's, it has value, but I think ultimately before I pick something, I've, I've got to read it. Um, coverage, you know, may or may not be useful to me. Yeah. You know, you mentioned something a couple of times. And it's very interesting here. Here you had a bachelor's in history, but you've talked about knowing the market share and knowing who the audience is and why would they want to look at it? How did you, how do you determine that? Cause those by are all making really a lot of mistakes. marketing. <laughs> <laughs> by, by making a lot of mistakes. I wish I had taken more business classes. If I could go back, I would have taken more business classes because that, you know, it's show business. It's the art and science. It's together. That's what makes it so interesting is that you need mm -hmm. both of those disciplines to sort of succeed. And you've got to be able to interact with the studio executives or the financiers because that's all they're thinking about. They're thinking about their investment. And they're thinking mm -hmm. about how that's going to work. Uh, and that's the first thing that they're thinking about is who's going to come see this if I invest $5 million in your movie on Dietrich Bonhoeffer? Why would people come see right. that? Who's going to come? And if you're not conversant, if you're not smart about that, if you're not articulate about that, um, you know, that money's going to go away. So if you're going to be in business, if you're going to be a producer and you want to make stuff and you want to convince investors that you know what you're doing, then you better be mm -hmm. smart about your audience. You better be smart about market share. And you can, you can read up, you can figure that out, you can learn, you can be taught. Um, and the more projects you make, the more experience you'll have in uh, and figuring that out. You know, Ralph, th there's a follow-up question with that, and this is mine. Um, you just talked about the market share and the planning, but how much does the budget and the money part come into this? Because, you know, that seems like another part that you have a lot of hands-on responsibility for. I do, and, and um, I believe you can make a movie, a television show at any price. I've made $200 million movies, I've made $50,000 movies. I, I made a movie for 500,000 specifically because I didn't want to be known as a guy that's only making $100 million movies and up. And mm -hmm. we shot it on film, we shot it in LA, we shot it with Bill Shatner, we put it in theaters, oh, wow. we put it in, in we, we did something, you know, a business that used to be around called Blockbuster Video, we put it in Blockbuster yeah. Video stores. and. We went through the process and made a 
It's an okay movie. It's not great because um, we had a limited, you know, budget. But um, you can make a movie for any price. It's about choices. It's about what you want to do. Um, and those choices are uh, ironically easier at a lower budget because you don't have money for a technocrank. You don't have money for fancy gear. Uh, you've got to pay your crew. You've got to feed them. And uh, you've got to figure out how to get it done in, in, a, in a few days. So I like making some of those smaller movies from time to time. We're prepping one right now that you make for a low price point. Just keeps you in mm -hmm. touch with what's important, making creative choices. How does it advance the story? You know, how do we do this in a way that's efficient? Um, but also, you know, making choices of where you do want to spend the money because that's going to add mm -hmm. value and you're going to see it on screen. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I've been fortunate to sort of manage, you know, I, mm -hmm. you know, scour that budget and be sure those, all those assumptions are correct. Um, and everybody's in agreement and managing everyone's expectations. That's a big part of what I do, managing expectations so that when we go out and we've got a budget and it's locked down, that we're going to make it for that price. And part of my job is to have forward looking radar to be sure that we're not going to exceed that price. Or if we do, we're doing it because someone made a change or someone agreed to spend more money. So managing those expectations on the creative side and on the finance side is, uh, is key. You know, having said that, one of the things I've heard, I wanted to ask you about that. So if somebody's working with a low budget film and we keep hearing, oh, well, having a name actor of some kind in there is important. But now there's so many people on YouTube that has a lot of followers. Um, if you're going to pick, if you had to take your budget and put it in one place that you thought would give you the best shot and maybe getting marketing, how important is it to have somebody who has a, a strong YouTube or Facebook following or an Instagram following in helping you get that promoted once, once you shoot it? Yeah, I think that is important. You, you do need you know, in the days of DVDs, it's, it's important the face that's on the cover of the DVD. Mm -hmm. So today, what's the face that you're going to promote? People want to see, well, what's Kevin? Oh, Kevin Hart and Ryan Reynolds in a movie. Okay, I'll go see that movie. You know, the, the, that has weight and value. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, does the a high YouTube, Instagram following, you know, have weight and value? Sure. At, at a certain kind of audience and a certain audience, if you can get to them. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, that does have value and worth. Um, but you also got to pay attention to the story. You, you, you know, just having a pretty face that can't deliver on the story is not very helpful and it won't have any legs. It won't, it won't last. But that's, that's always part of that, you know, alchemy of yeah. the story, the acting, who's the audience, who do they want to see. Um, yeah. it's, it's sort of a no-brainer at some point to say, well, mm -hmm. we just want Kevin Hart. Well, okay, fine. Uh, but there's only so many movies he can make. What else is out there? And, you know, Kevin Hart's probably not cheap at this point. He probably costs a lot of money. So, you know, if you're going to maintain your budget, you know, who can you afford within that budget to, uh, to do that? And um, that's always a trick. Yeah. You know, the, it's interesting. I think when people probably came on this interview, they weren't expecting they're going to be going to an MBA program in, uh, movie production, but you just covered a lot of really crucial things. So thanks for doing that. Um, one of the questions that came through here is what do you look for in hiring a director and do you look at their work or do you interview them first? Yeah, I think you, you do. Uh, I, I do talk to them first. I want to see them face to face. Mm -hmm. And then you do want to look at their work is, you know, mm -hmm. there aren't many surprises if a director's made five or 10 movies, there's five or 10 examples of how they tell stories, how they go about it, how they treat, you know, uh, actors, how they treat the writer. Um, there's lots written about directors. You can, you can find it in, in lots of publications now. So mm -hmm. yeah, I try to do my homework uh, in selecting a director. You, you want to do your homework carefully. Okay. And then, how do you know or discover what people will pay to see things? That's kind of going along back in that marketing question we had about, I mean, do you, do you actually have somebody do the market research? Do you actually, or do you do it yourself? Once you identify, like, do you go, oh, this one's for 
women from 35 to 55. So it must be for moms with kids and, and grandmas. Or how do, you, how do you determine that? Well, you'll determine it somewhat in, you know, in the process of making the picture. So we have a project, a lower budget project we're pitching with Lifetime. And Lifetime has, you know, a high viewership, female viewership. So mm -hmm. before they pick the project, they're going to know, does that, does this project, will my audience watch? So you're depending on their relationship, their marketing savvy of whether or not their audience is going to respond to it um, before they buy it, before they engage, before you connect with them. So sometimes it's the studio that does that frequently in, in, in those cases. Or in a movie like Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you know, mm -hmm. we'll probably engage a number of different um, faith-based marketing groups to find out, is that a story that will resonate? Is uh, this is a guy who resisted and actually was, was active in resisting and wanted part of a group to assassinate uh, Hitler. So is that important? Is that good? Is that relevant to today? Is that just a history story? Uh, you're going to engage a couple of groups to help figure that out. We think it is. We think it's important. But before we get the financing lined up, we'll probably want to hear from and employ a couple of uh, marketing groups to uh, do a study and find out if anybody would really, uh, you know, respond to that story. Yeah. You know, it's been interesting. One of the questions that came through, we've had, um, over the last 10 weeks, we had eight webinars at different times for our students um, with the actors, uh, directors, um, studio people. And one of the questions I keep asking is how important are the relational pieces you do? And, and so the question that came through here is, what techniques do you use or suggest to stay authentic, personable, and yet honest when others around you aren't treating you fairly? <laughs> Every project. That's a good question. Yeah. Every project. Every project? Yeah. Oh, wow. So, I mean. Um, so does that mean when you're the producer, you're always the bad guy? Or you're well, the heavy? I, I tend to be because, you know, I'm having conversations with people that no one else wants to have. And everyone else is reluctant to do it. Uh, and I guess maybe because I'm old now, I don't care. Um, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? You're going to fire me? I've been fired three or four times. It doesn't matter. That that. It hurts for a moment, but it doesn't really hurt. Um, look, I think I've been fortunate to be married for 46 years. I've got mm -hmm. a, a small group of guys that I connect with on a regular basis that keep me honest. Um, my friends could care less that I work in the movie business. They don't care. And, and that keeps me grounded. You know, uh, mm -hmm. they, they, care about me and who I am and my family. And uh, I've got my kids and my grandkids, you know, those are the things that keep me grounded and that's what's worthwhile and valuable. I'm done mm -hmm. to do a job and I'm, I'm in, you know, both feet, you know, it's a lot of times over my head, it seems. But um, I know that uh, I have worth and value because of my faith and my family and mm -hmm. my friends. And so, um, you know, working is fun. Working is a chance to, to uh, display some of that, hand, mm -hmm. you know, give away some of that love that, that has inspired me. I think also, you know, honestly, Jay, I think I learned a lot <clears throat> when I was working in a church in the youth programs and working in church leadership, because when you're, running a committee or you're running a group or you've got to do the stewardship video or you have to do, you know, some production that you're going to put on or some thing that you're doing for your organization. They're all volunteers and I can't mm -hmm. get rid of people. I can't fire people. Now in a movie, I can fire people. I can hire them and I can fire them. And I happens in every movie and you try to do that in a kind way. Again, how you treat people. I mm -hmm. can't fire anybody in the church. I have to figure out, how I get everybody to work together and everybody has a meaningful job. And I had to figure out how to serve them. 
How am I going to help them be a better person through this process? Mm -hmm. And I take some of that with me in, in working on movies. How can I serve the director? How can I be sure that the director gets everything that he or she wants and, and in a way that you know, fits within the budget and with everyone else's expectations? How can I serve them? How can I serve the, the, the costumer? How can I serve the, the, the prop person to be sure they have all they need to make it creative, stay on target and all, all those kinds of things. So for me, it's, it's, mu it's very much wrapped up in that training that I had, you know, uh, growing up in the church um, and, and how to lead a volunteer organization. I think leading a volunteer organization, one of the hardest jobs in the world. Again, because you can't fire people. You, mm -hmm. you have to figure out how to, how to make everybody's job worthwhile and everybody feel important. That's hard. That's, I, I, I don't relish those jobs. Yeah. I, you know, Ralph, it's, it's interesting because I've actually been in that situation too. And there's times I feel like I've done well and there's times I don't think I've been very loving or very patient. Uh, and I have to go back and apologize because I defeated the purpose that I was supposed to be there for. And, um, you know, you must run into things when, you, when you're leading an organization or in this case, a, a, a movie, when you run into things where it's something you sure didn't expect uh, and it's something that's a little heavy, um, do, you, do you feel like that's something God still had you, had you prepared for? And how do you, how do you handle that? I don't know if you're ever really prepared for it. And I think if you were to look, I don't need to mention names, but I think if you were to look down my resume, you'd see names of directors and producers I've worked with who are in the news and in jail or uh, mm -hmm. discredited. Um, mm -hmm. And those are tough conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, it goes back to the couple of questions ago in terms of being grounded and knowing who you are and who you represent and who's backing you that you can sort of be confident to know that, yeah, it's a hard conversation. It's not, no one relishes reprimanding somebody or calling them out on something that's very, very sensitive, but um, that's the job. That's, that's what it calls for. And uh, you know, I don't, I don't know that you're ever prepared for it, but, you know, there's, there's a sense that life prepares you for that, that all of your experience coming before that prepares you to speak to those powerful people and have mm -hmm. a conversation that's uncomfortable. And again, you know, and I, I think this is, I haven't always had this, but a, a lot of the time I have is that what's the worst thing that's going to happen? What, that they don't want me around anymore or going to say no? It's Okay. I think you've got to be prepared to see what the worst case is. When you know what the worst case is going to be, you, you've got confidence to go into the situation and speak the truth. That's a great insight. Is there, um, when you've had something like that, is there a story, and, and this is totally off, you know, we didn't prepare for this, but along that line, is, is there a story you can think of off top that something like that happened and how it, resolved that you could share with us? Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, I know that's last no, minute. No, but... no, no, it's fine. The, I'm just, I'm, yeah. I, I, I'm you trying to have think a bunch of something. Of them. Yeah. Well, I'm, I don't know what's, you know, appropriate for prime time. That's the problem. Um, look, sometimes those things don't work out and, 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 and you have the conversation and it doesn't work out the way the studio wanted or the financier or anybody else, but you have to have those conversations. Um, frequently it doesn't work out the way you think. And at, at least there's satisfaction in knowing that you did your job, you stepped up, you, you did the hard thing that no one else was willing to do. And, um, you know, at least in the position that I'm in, that's what I'm paid to do. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm okay to do it. Um, it's the job. Uh, that's what it calls for. Yeah. You know, we have a, a question. It's, it says in a lot of ways, it seems that um, widespread audiences are getting tired of blockbuster films. 
do you think we're going to continue to see the trend of indie style films becoming more popular as people reach for more emotionally impactful stories? It's a good question. And I think probably right. I think, you know, from a bunch of standpoints, from marketing, from economics, et cetera, I think mm -hmm. that, uh, bigger budget movies will become more expensive to view and be an event to go out to. You can sort of mm -hmm. see that happening from the virus and all that right now. Um, I think audiences have always been after a compelling emotional story, um, emotional impact. You know, you may not like the story on Avatar, but the story in Avatar affected and brought in the biggest box office ever. Uh, because in some ways it was emotional for people and that hero's journey that that Jake goes on in that in that story where he's mm -hmm. oh by the way reborn he's born again in the end of mm -hmm. that movie um, had a global impact because it was not only a big technological achievement but it was an emotional story um, audiences are always going to gravitate to that I think when mm -hmm. when blockbuster movies when when, when big event movies don't deliver the emotional impact, people will stop going. Uh, mm -hmm. I think there's more and more opportunity for indie films. And you see that with all the streaming services and certainly now all the stuff at home. But um, that's the trick. That's the trick is to develop and produce something that's emotionally compelling. We want that. We, we crave that. That's the stories we tell around the campfire, mm -hmm. around the dinner table, yeah. is the compelling emotional, be it funny, be it strange, be it horror, be it whatever. whatever. Mm -hmm. Those are the right. stories that we come back to all the time. And uh, how we can do that and make a business out of it, that's the trick. Mm -hmm. Another question from the audience they'd like to know is, what are some of the productions or films that you've learned the most from or, or what films have been the biggest surprises to you in terms of how much their success or failure differed from your expectations? Captain Ron was a fun movie to work on because A, I was leaving Paramount, working for Disney, Jeffrey Katzenberg, and Marty Short and Kurt Russell, you know, wanted to be opposite. Kurt wanted to be the funny guy, Marty wanted to be the, the, the straight guy. And we had a lot of fun filming that. It's wacky, it's, it's weird, it's goofy. Um, had a lot of fun doing that. And it was a shocker when we went to the theaters. And of course, when the titles come up in a Marty Short's name there, everyone starts laughing. And when Kurt Russell's name comes up, everybody's like, ooh. And we couldn't best, we couldn't beat the audience expectations of what they wanted to see Marty Short do and what they wanted to see Kurt Russell do. And so the movie didn't perform. Um, wow. so we didn't have the vehicle, I think, to sort of, uh, change those, uh, audience expectations. It's like wanting to see mm -hmm. Arnold Schwarzenegger in a comedy. You don't really want that. You want to see him in an action movie. And, mm -hmm. um, but some people have been able to change that, you know, comedians, Robin Williams changed from being just a, a comedy guy to a drama. Um, so I, I a couple of movies like that, I've learned that. Just because you think it's funny when you're filming, it doesn't mean it's going to be funny when it's finished. Um, there's a different thing about the storytelling and the structure. That's a whole other discussion. Um, mm -hmm. So I've learned a lot on movies like that where we were just fooled. We were just you. You can you can you can you know we did we did the same in Star Trek. We 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 made. Star Trek three and four were very good movies and four was probably the most accessible for non Star Trek fans. And then it mm -hmm. seemed like maybe we were smoking our own press releases because we made Star Trek five and it was so inside, we almost killed the franchise. Um, oh. We, we didn't, we, we took for granted that core audience and what they wanted. And we, we didn't pay attention to the wider audience that we had just embraced successfully in Star Trek four. And so that was a wake up call. Um, mm. And, you know, look, I've, been, I've made a lot of movies over a lot of years. I'm learning a lot with Michael Mann uh, on this TV mm -hmm. series we're making in Tokyo about um, uh, this journalist and his story 
Um, mm -hmm. It's called Tokyo Vice. It'll be on HBO Max. And learning a great deal about the process and, and, and the way that Michael Mann directs actors. I'm learning stuff I've never seen in other directors uh, in the last 30 plus years. So, yeah, I mean, I think if you're paying attention, every movie's got something to teach you. And hopefully uh, you don't have to repeat the, the lessons over and over. Mm -hmm. You know, it's an interesting thing you mentioned, Ralph. You've been doing this for a long time. You've had success. But what you talked about with Michael Mann, is this industry one where you perpetually learn or you should perpetually learn? Well, the, the audience keeps changing. The, the storytelling styles keep changing. Mm -hmm. um, there's always new and fresh storytelling that comes up that is surprising. I remember when The Matrix came out. The Matrix was very different in 99. And when that came out, that sort of upset everybody. Every few years, there's a movie that comes out and sort of upsets the apple cart. And everybody goes, oh, well, we've got to do, we got to do it different now. Right. Um, so, yeah, I think you, 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 to stay fresh, you, you've got to, you, you got to be nimble and you've got to be learning and you've got to pay attention. Uh, and to me, that's always useful to be with younger filmmakers who are thinking mm -hmm. differently. They don't come with the baggage that I bring. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, I enjoy reading some of the older uh, stories about Hollywood in the 30s and 40s because, ironically, some of that stuff is exactly the same. Uh, it's just mm -hmm. different names and different situations, but the learning curve and stuff they learned is the same kind of things that we learn. Um, so... Yeah, I, I think if you want to stay fresh and relevant, you, you, you've you got to keep paying attention. So mm -hmm. I'm trying. I don't know. Maybe I won't work after this. We'll see. I don't know. <laughs> you know, um, this is a good follow-up question to what we talked about earlier. What they were asking is, what do you think Christian films need to do in order to stay relevant in the film industry in terms of reaching secular moviegoers? Ugh. Christian movies are not very good. And, and mostly because they're bad stories. They're, they mm -hmm. got to tell, we got to tell authentic stories that, that reach a wider audience and stop trying to preach to people. So everybody says they want to do that. And then when I read their script, you know, I can't get past page 10. Um, mm -hmm. We've got to tell authentic stories and you tell an authentic story and people, uh, you know, people will gravitate to that. Um, I think the Bible, you know, has five or 600 compelling stories. Most of mm -hmm. them about broken people. Most of them are actually dark stories. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, the parable of the prodigal son opens with the son saying to his father, I want you dead so I can have my inheritance. That's a pretty dark story. It's a pretty dark opening for a movie. Mm -hmm. um, and yet we tell, we want to tell these happy stories. We want to be uplifting. We want to be about good things and that's not bad but we don't tell tell it in a compelling way we don't structure those stories in a way that um is going to achieve you know a wider audience so mm -hmm. we, do, we just need better storytellers um and we need to put more resources to that but until we demonstrate that we can make better movies for the christian community at a smaller price point um I don't know that we're ever going to get the resources to expand that out. Um, and look, I think there's also for us in the faith community, we need to be attentive and have our eyes open to what other filmmakers are doing and saying. Um, mm -hmm. Movie that won an Academy Award in 99, American Beauty, you mm -hmm. know, opens with a character asking questions about his life and, um, and at the end of his life, at the end of the movie, the very same questions asked in the book of Ecclesiastes, the very same questions that mankind has been asking for thousands of years. And yet we dismiss the movie in the Christian community because, you know, it made fun of middle America. It made fun of things. It was irreverent, but it, it missed all the crucial questions. And even the movies that are made by Christians, Tree of Life by Terrence Malick or um, a movie like the Les Mis movie that, that uh, Hugh Jackman was mm -hmm. in. These are some of the greatest stories of redemption ever told mm -hmm. and the church ignores them. The church doesn't pay attention. 
Um, so for Christians who want to make movies that have a redemptive value, they need to be great, compelling stories. Okay. You know, that's, that's a really good insight. One of, the, one of our, uh, I believe one of our students asked, what do you suggest young people with video and film degrees do to break into the world of filmmaking? So like what kind of types of experiences or related industries or what would you, what would you suggest? Well, again, I think every business right now has video. So, you know, if you were, you, you, look at how much video is being played on, on your local newspaper. Uh, the mm -hmm. New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, there's videos that play all the time. Well, they, they have a video department. I worked for a department store. I don't know if department stores are gonna last much longer, but uh, <laughs> certainly there's lots of retailers that have a video right. department. They've gotta get the message mm -hmm. out. They've gotta get about product information or about how they train their employees. Um, there's, you know, universities have that. Mm -hmm. um, Every business is using media and videotape in a way to tell stories, to get information out. And churches, again, 200,000 churches that, you know, all except a, a thousand of them probably don't spend much money or attention on it and need that. Those are great experiences. Um, there, there's plenty of opportunity out there. And you don't have to measure success that if I don't make a movie at Paramount Pictures, then I'm unsuccessful. I don't think that's true at all. A friend of mine that was at our church and we made a short movie together, uh, a bit irreverent, tried to put it up for Academy Award consideration uh, when we were both working at Disney, um, moved on and moved his family uh, you know, down south and he was working for Walmart, making videos. He stayed at Walmart, I think seven or eight years. He's now on his own doing very well, living in a very quiet part of the country and, mm -hmm. um, and, and using his storytelling skills for marketing and advertising based on, you know, doing just sort of basic work for Walmart for seven or eight years. Uh, there's, there's a lot of opportunities out there. You just don't just think about Warner Brothers and Paramount. Got to think, you know, broader than that. Again, Storytelling is out there on, in every avenue. Real estate companies use, use uh, video and storytelling and media. Um, so, so keeping your eyes open, there's plenty of, plenty of opportunities out there. And, and maybe, you know, in your community, in where you are, there's an advantage to using video and, and, and build a new business opportunity for people that don't even know they don't need video. Um, Maybe the agriculture, I don't know. There's, there's con getting information across visually can be much more powerful and compelling and faster than just yakking at people and, uh, mm -hmm. or doing printed materials. Um, there's, there's lots of advantages to that. And it's, I think we can just keep thinking creatively about how to do that. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. One of the questions that came through was, could you elaborate on the difference between working on films with multiple producers versus a film where you're the sole producer? Well, it depends. It seems like there's a lot the project of producers I mean, now. Yeah. Well, sure. But the, the business is more complicated. You know, movies are more expensive. Some pr producers do certain things. Others don't. Some producers will just work with talent. Uh, they don't know the nuts and bolts of how to do it day to day. Um, yeah, I think movies in days gone by had one or two producers. Mm -hmm. uh, but the job has become complex and it involves a lot of people. Now, again, as you said at the beginning, the job mm -hmm. of a producer um, is very clearly defined. Um, at the Producers Guild, we arbitrate who gets the, the, the PGA letters, Producers Guild of America, after their name on the credits. And that is honored by the Academy and only those people are eligible to pick up the Oscar as the last award, as you've mentioned. So mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times producer titles are given away for financing. Yeah, you know, they put a million dollars in, they can get an executive producer credit. That's very common. And that's proliferated mm -hmm. with a lot of independent production. So the only way you really know who made the movie, who, w without this person, 
the movie could not have been made. Um, you'll find those letters now, Producers Guild of America next to them, that they were essential. They were there at the beginning to help shape and form it. They had the idea, they found the money, they found the studio, they found the distribution. Somehow they were involved all those steps mm -hmm. along the way. And the Producers Guild publishes a two page list of what those specific mm -hmm. responsibilities are at each stage of production. Um, so yeah, uh, a lot of movies, I've seen movies with 29, 37 producers, but there's really mm -hmm. only, you know, two or three that do the job. Yeah. You know, it's one of the questions that came through is it seems like there's talk lately about the film industry moving away from Hollywood. And so have you seen this to be true or is it still vital to live in Hollywood to really find success in films? A lot of decision making on the creative is made in Los Angeles and Los Angeles area. Mm -hmm. uh, just tends to be where those executives live and where those companies are. Um, mm -hmm. Just like New York has probably more of the finance companies uh, and the financial business uh, mm -hmm. is, is based in, in New York. Um, I think for, for you to live in Michigan, you can keep and should keep that local flavor of what you write, how you think, how you see the world, how you view what's going on and, and your perspective. I think that's valuable. And you, you don't need to come to Hollywood to get that, you know, mashed in to be, you know, sequelized into, you know, Hunger Games 9. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that outside perspective is useful and helpful. It is also useful to be in Hollywood and to be around those decision makers and be, you know, to develop relationships and um, be in development. It depends on what you want to do. It depends mm -hmm. on your skill, the skill set you want. Uh, so for some, it might be worthwhile to come and maybe you come and try it out. Maybe you come for a couple of years to, to live here and see if you can't make it work. Um, mm -hmm. But it's certainly more distributed. Um, and at least until, until the virus, you know, most people do want to see the writer face to face. Um, right. And I think like any business, uh, maybe the business, the businesses you've run, Jay, that people want to be in business with people they like. They want to be mm -hmm. in business with people they can hang out with or have a meal with. Um, they, they like to build a relationship and know what they're getting because you're investing a lot in a writer or a director. Um, oh, yeah. But there's also a lot of value and a lot of people that don't live in Hollywood and, and a lot of stuff doesn't shoot in Hollywood anyway. Uh, television does, not a lot of features. So mm -hmm. you can sort of live where you want um, as long as you can, you know, still connect with those people that are making decisions and still can discern the kinds of projects that are going to, uh, that an audience is going to turn out for. Okay. We got, we got, um, an, another couple of questions here that are around Christian filmmakers, which you brought. One question was what you take on Christian filmmakers is contrasted to filmmakers who happen to be Christians. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably in the latter category. You know, I don't hire people because they're Christians. I'll hire people who are the best at the position that I'm looking for. They happen to be a Christian. That's great. But wearing their Christianity up front or, or making me aware of that or somehow that that's more important isn't necessarily going to be uh, the right person for the job. I don't want a Christian plumber. I want a guy that's going to fix my pipes. Mm -hmm. I don't want a Christian brain surgeon. I want a brain surgeon who knows what he's doing. If he happens to be a Christian, that's awesome. Uh, excellence, you know, goes a long way. And so I think that's what we should strive for. I think that's what we're called to as people of faith. Uh, and if you're going to represent, you know, the Christian faith, you ought to be excellent in everything that you do. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. There was a question that followed up on that. And is, um, is there a place for profanity in films made by Christians since that's how some people speak? 
again, you know, I don't want to um, irritate uh, the audience out there, but I probably would draw that line a little wider than maybe others. And so, yeah, I'd say, you know, watching the Godfather films and having characters say, gosh, darn it, I don't like the way you did that. And I'm going to uh, end your life. Um, doesn't feel like reality. It doesn't feel like the world that I live in and the people that I know. So, yeah, I think there's a place for it. And I don't think that's, you know, I don't think that's the worst thing that can happen. Uh, again, it's, it's the storytelling it has, has got to be there. Now, look, I mm -hmm. went to bat with the head of the studio at Fox at the time on one of the X-Men movies because Wolverine was using the F word. And I went and argued about that with the head of the studio because of the market share. Why would you turn off? Why would you get an R rating on, on this movie just so that he can say those words and you miss out on an audience? And why would you do that in a way that turns off, you know, a portion of the audience, even if you've got a PG-13, why do it? So I didn't get all the words out, but I got some of them out. Um, and that was really based on marketing. But I, look, it's got to be appropriate. It's got to be, it's got to fit. It's got to be, it, 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 it's, if it's organic to the story, if it, if it, if it fits, if it works, then um, I'm not opposed to it. Okay. We're getting down to the last couple of questions here, Ralph, because it's, we, I, I appreciate it all the time. Sure. Um, the, the question uh, I've got here is how do you as a producer choose to address changes that the studio wants to see when you and the director and the writer don't see it turn out the way you wanted to, to do in the post. So he's thinking of uh, Zack Snyder getting his cut of Justice League and a call from the fans for David Ayers to get his cut of the Suicide Squad released. Yeah, so those are very big films, very big personalities, mm -hmm. lots of power play, all that kind of stuff. I think usually you're in a, the best spot if you fight for the movie. You fight mm -hmm. for the story. You fight for what you think is the best version of the story to put on the screen. And I think you'll always be in the right position if you do that. Um, look, mm -hmm. studios aren't stupid. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of filmmakers go out on their own and are not as successful as they were at the studio. That sort of combative conversation that happens at a studio frequently can be good for the story. It can frequently make a better story that isn't exactly what the studio wanted or what the filmmaker wanted. But mm -hmm. that creative, that cauldron, that, that intense, uh, pressurized environment uh, sometimes creates a better product. Um, so, you know, Zack Snyder's a smart guy. Uh, I don't know David Ayers, but, um, you know, they're trying to weigh those things and figure that out. And, and they're fighting for the story. They're fighting for a way to do that. And there's lots of ways to tell the story. And, you know, uh, mm -hmm. we'll see how they perform and if Zack Snyder's version is better and all that. So uh, I, I think you're always in the best position when you're fighting for the story. And it's story based. It's here's how this is enhancing the story or adding value. You know, let me ask, I know we covered a ton of ground. Is there, is there one thing that you wanted to touch on or share that we didn't cover? Well, look, I think you're doing a good thing at Compass. I think that, you know, you have an opportunity and you're reaching out to folks like me that, that uh, have worked in the business a long time and, and ask these questions and get some input. I'm, I'm certainly, I was on a phone call earlier today, mm -hmm. irritated with Christians in particular who don't even pick up the phone to call somebody like me to get my opinion uh, or, or get my advice in terms of what they ought to do. And there's such, there's such a limited amount of finance that goes into Christian media that mm -hmm. we got to be careful and we got to be smart about how that money is spent and utilized and how it represents uh, Christianity 
And so mm -hmm. I like what Compass is doing, and that's why I've been involved for so long. And and I'm glad that you're reaching out to folks like me and Mark Clayman and uh, David Weiss and others that that can help you get some practical experience. But the best thing is you, you're, you're going to be, you're, you're telling stories. You've got so many outlets now that if you think you got the goods, then you make a story, take it to a festival, see if you can get other people to stand up and salute. Um, you know, the, the, the playing field's quite level at the, in that way. Um, the question is, you know, do you have the goods? Can you do it? It's easy to talk about it. It's easy to chat on Twitter and Facebook mm -hmm. and moan about how other people don't know what they're doing. Well, okay, pick up a camera, use your phone, do something, you know, tell the story, Sh demonstrate, show me that you can do that. It's one yeah. thing to talk about it. It's another to do it. And, uh, you know, I spent my life doing that stuff and mm -hmm. you should jump in. Water's fine. Come on. That's great. Well, Ralph, I really appreciate the time and, and what we're able to share, what you're able to share with all our you know, students and alumni and affiliates, and just for West Michigan to see that they can make a difference and they actually have career opportunities uh, if they follow the things, the principles you followed, and, and that there's faith-based people who can actually make a difference too. So I want to really thank you for doing that today. I also just need to take a minute and I want to thank um, Scott Terpstra, who's the president of the Scott Allen Creative who sponsored this. Uh, Scott, it turns out that uh, Jeff's uh, son is actually a Compass alumni who's been on several films. And then I also want to thank Bill McKendry, who is one of the co-founders of Compass, but also he's the uh, also co-founder of the group up here called Do More Good. And what Do More Good does is they actually help not-for-profits tell their stories so they can do more good than they're doing now. So I wanna thank Bill McKendry for doing that. The other thing that happens here, when you do these Zoom pieces, um, there's a whole team that's behind me here. Um, uh, and I just wanna recognize Julie Kim who's doing this and uh, Bill Kavan, our Dean of Education who is handling all these questions. Alex Bradley, our marketing director who is getting all this coordinated and then Aaron Greer who handled the shooting. So I just wanna acknowledge and thank all those folks too. So Ralph, thanks so much. I hope okay. you have a great rest of the night. And I want okay. to thank everybody for joining us. Take care, Ralph. God bless. All right. Thanks.